have been everywhere, done everything. Um, he, uh, among many other accomplishments, was the founder of the Planetary Society. And uh, Louis is going to talk to us about uh, visiting an ex exoplanet. Thank you. Actually, I've spent my whole working career in the solar system. And um, to be specific, I've spent it in planetary missions. And so I, I've spent a whole in planetary missions. What makes planetary missions special is the search for life. That's the key question that dominates people's interest in space and dominates really this, why we even have a space program. We want to know if we're alone in the universe. We want to know what is the origin and nature of life. And even if we're uh, uh, alone, we want to know what the conditions for life are. So it's a driving factor is uh, searching for life. I think that's also the driving factor in everything we want to know about exoplanets. And even though this group, and, and we tend here to be focusing on the engineering of interstellar exploration, we want to not lose sight of the fact that the driving force behind that, the reason we're doing that is to uh, really look for life in the solar system. Now, there's lots of life in the solar system, probably. We don't know that yet. We haven't discovered any uh, besides uh, on our own planet, but there are exoplanets uh, and on the exoplanets, uh, we now know there are billions of exoplanets. We know there are uh, a large percentage of them, or some percentage of them are in a habitable zone. Many with the, are Earth-like in their size. Some are Earth-like in their temperatures. And, uh, and we know a lot from the studies of, of life here on Earth that life exists in, in lots of extreme environments. So we're optimistic about the idea of finding life in the universe and, and exoplanets in particular with so many to look at, uh, the, there's a, a tremendous push to, uh, to be exploring exoplanets. And that's exactly what my talk is going to be about, which is the idea of trying to uh, explore exoplanets. But it's a difficult job. If we take a look at an exoplanet from any telescope on earth, it's one pixel. It's not even one pixel. And we can't do better than that. Any telescope that we could build in any practical sense still can't uh, image an exoplanet. Uh, 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 it still will be less than one pixel of a, uh, the distance is too great. We, we would like to get up closer than that, but no, uh, the, to do that, we, uh, in the solar system, we're stuck with the lambda over D limitation of telescopes. But the, uh, the idea of, uh, of limiting ourselves with telescopes, can we get there? And that's, uh, and that's what I'm gonna talk about next is the, there are really two ways of getting there. One is the idea of real exploit, really getting there with interstellar probes. And the idea of, uh, and that is just at the present time, a bridge too far. We know now, and we've heard it many times here that the only method that is actually being worked on as practical is that we have to get our energy outside from an external energy source, either and from sunlight or beamed energy. We have to have beamed energy to, to make it. This is the work of Bob Forward that really many years ago uh, made that uh, the notion of practical interstellar flight. And of course, it's been carried on by Phil Lubin. And now a Breakthrough Foundation, a Breakthrough Initiatives is really doing developmental work on that idea. Idea. So it's an exciting idea that we can get there, but even in that idea, it's very technology limited. Uh, with the most practical thing that you think of is they're hoping to get to the nearest star with one gram in, tw in 20 years. Now that's, that's, and that's only the nearest star. And that means only one exoplanet or maybe a couple at that star and they're not the most, if you look at the survey of habitable exoplanets, they're not necessarily the most interesting ones. We want to survey lots of exoplanets. We being the community would like to survey lots of exoplanets. We'd like to explore exoplanets, find out conditions of habitability as they vary, and also conditions of whether the most possible uh, ones to look at. So the idea is that to reach an exoplanet, uh, we need to... Um, uh, uh, 
uh, we can't, it, it's a bridge too far for now. And maybe with all of the things we've been hearing about, it'll be something of the future. But for now, something else comes to the rescue. And that's the idea of virtually exploring exoplanets. We can virtually explore exoplanets because we're very, nature comes to the rescue to overcome that telescope limitation that I mentioned by having a solar gravity lens that magnifies uh, whatever it's looking at by a hundred billion times by a factor of 10 to the 11th. That means using the solar gravity lens, we could not just not merely see an exoplanet, we could resolve surface features on an exoplanet. We could see forests, we could see uh, seas and lakes, and if we're lucky enough, we could see cities. The idea that, uh, uh, that if we could use the solar gravity lens uh, as, a, as, as a telescope, that would give us the ability to see exoplanets. And it's not distance limited. We could see exoplanets 10 light years away, 50 light years away, 100 light years away. And in that region, there are at least a dozen candidates of potentially habitable exoplanets, uh, possibilities for life. Now, not all of these are we gonna see life, but even as we learn from the varying conditions, will be doing comparative studies to see the conditions for life and it'll be the most important result we can get. So we're highly motivated to do it. So all we have to do is use that nature telescope. Problem is it's pretty far away. It's 550 AU is where it begins. And the solar gravity lens uh, begins at 550 AU. It's formed by the fact that light rays when they go by the sun are bent and as they go varying distance by the sun, they're bent at different angles and they uh, form a locus of points uh, starting at 550 AU out to infinity basically. Uh, and so uh, we have to not just get to the focal point. Fortunately, it's a focal line because we couldn't stop there if we got there. We would wanna, fl we wanna fly down that focal line and do the imaging as we fly down the focal line. The, Solar gravity lens, say, is 550 AU. That's a tall order. We've never gone in the solar system past 140 AU. That's where Voyager is. So this would be further than we've ever gotten. And in, on this chart, it looks like it's halfway between here and Alpha Centauri, but this is a logarithmic scale. And those are factors of 10 in distances between the way. And in fact, it's really only uh, one five hundredth of the way to Alpha Centauri. So uh, compared to interstellar flight, it's a very short distance away, but it's still longer than any place we've ever gone. And it's a engineering challenge to get that far. But what, if we can get that far, what we do is we use this bending of light rays to form the focal line. And we take an Earth-like planet and we would see it not as an image in a square, you know, like a image, like you're used to seeing in a photograph, like we do with planetary spacecraft, when we get images of the planets, we would, it actually, the image gets constructed in what's known as the Einstein ring around the focal line. And the Einstein ring is basically has to be sampled pixel by pixel to reconstruct the image. So uh, you end up getting a, a convoluted image, which is the one in the uh, left there. And then when it's deconvoluted, you'll end up with the uh, image of the exoplanet. And it's very much now uh, this work, which is being led by, which is being done by Slava Turyashev at JPL. Uh, he's now gone through all the simulations necessary, including even accounting for the sun's oblateness and all the factors that, that uh, could perturb that uh, um, uh, imaging process. It takes integration time to do the deconvolving. So, but you will spend your time on the focal line doing that deconvolving and producing the images of the exoplanets. We should point out that in a system like TRAPPIST, which has several uh, potentially habitable exoplanets, you could jump from focal line to focal line while you're maneuvering down uh, on this, on a single mission and see multiple planets, uh, sort of like as if you were orbiting Jupiter, Jupiter and going from multiple moons to see it. But if you wanna see planets around different stars, you have to have different missions because then they would be going to a totally different geometric region, totally different uh, uh, focal line. The concept we've come up with to do this is a solar sailing uh, mission to uh, uh, reach the exoplanet. Why solar sailing? Well, 
the advantage is, first of all, any other technique to get out there in a finite, in a, in a reasonable mission lifetime, the goal being to get out to uh, 500, 600 AU and 20, uh, 20 AU per year, for example, in less than 30 years, uh, you'd have to use nuclear and uh, that's not on the horizon now. Nobody's even working on developing that. Uh, or you'd have to use a chemical rocket that would go like two solar radii from the sun with a giant heat shield. Uh, and that's a massive uh, launch vehicle problem as well as a uh, technology problem that uh, for a massive. Uh, so in thinking big, you would go nuclear or try to do something like that. The opposite is to think small. A small sat and a solar sail can go to say 0.2 AU or, or 0.15 AU, uh, still uh, close to the sun, but nowhere near as close as those distances. And uh, pick up the necessary speed to get out at 20 AU per year. We've come up with a different sail design. This has been led by Explore, a private company uh, that's uh, uh, working on this with Lagarde, uh, who has got a solar sail experience. And they took the sun vanes that were on the Lagarde Sunjammer spacecraft and made this new spacecraft design all vanes, basically multiple sails. This gives the ability to uh, pa package it on a small set, uh, much much simpler because now each of the sails is smaller. They can be, uh, they don't have to be deployed and unfurled in the in the same uh, fashion. You can and you can get more area to mass uh, uh, in a in a in an easier packaging volume. In addition, you get a lot of control capability from the individual vanes, and so it gives you a more flexible uh, control design, especially if you're trying to achieve multiple jet objectives as you fly in toward the sun to pick up your speed and then outward uh, to go to your uh, um, exit the solar system. So the basic mission concept is shown here, where uh, because it's a solar sail, you don't need to get a large launch vehicle. In fact, you could ride share up to a high uh, Earth orbit or to C3 equals zero, uh, and then spiral in toward the sun using the sail to tack in toward the sun. Um, and then uh, as you get to perihelion, you turn the sail and you pick up all your solar power. And if you are, um, and depending on the distance, there are three important factors, distance, uh, perihelion, the area of the sail, and the mass of the spacecraft. And I'll show that on the next slide. But the, uh, depending on that, you can achieve speeds um, as high as 20 AU per year or even higher uh, in advanced uh, designs. So this shows the trade-offs and what it, uh, and basically you want as large an area as possible to catch solar sunlight and solar uh, photon energy. You want the mass as small as possible uh, because it's proportional to area to mass, mass as small as possible so that the momentum from the photons goes into velocity and you want the peri uh, perihelion to be as low as possible so that you can get maximum sunlight power. And you see on the graph here, the perihelion distance is actually the key, uh, uh, is, is the factor you should work on the hardest. Uh, sure, you can get your area to mass. Right now, the current solar sail, the two successful solar sails that are flying, light sail, uh, uh, which is done by the Planetary Society, has an area to mass ratio of about eight, and uh, Icaros had an even lower uh, area to mass ratio. Uh, to get up to 100 or 200 is going to take uh, the real advantage of the small sat design and, uh, and larger sail deployments, and that's why we went to that other configuration. But you can do your area to mass ratio increases, and our current design right now for a text, test mission we're looking at is somewhere in around the 50 to 60 range. Um, but if you can get your perihelion distance, you see that uh, with uh, getting close to the sun like uh, 10 solar radii, uh, you will get an enormous increase on that. And now people are working on sail materials that can do that. Ordinary uh, CP1 or Kapton uh, certainly will allow you to get to 0.2 AU. And that's good enough for the current uh, uh, kind of missions, but in the future, we'd like to get even closer and, uh, and, and get the, uh, uh, so that we can get the higher exit speeds. 
So um, right now we're working on a technology test mission, not the full mission that would go out to the solar gravity lens focus. As I've indicated, that's taking technology development to get the area to mass ratio as high as possible and to do these sail materials that will get close, as well as to fly the interplanetary small sat, which has not yet been done. But uh, to, we wanna prove that concept in a much uh, smaller mission, one that would only exit the solar system at five to six AU per year. Now I say only, that's still about twice Voyager uh, speed and would be the fastest spacecraft ever uh, if we can get this launched in a few years, like we hope to, because it's basically a rather small, uh, simple small sat design and the uh, prototype is actually being built right now. And uh, so this mission is probably affordable at low cost and it would still have the ability to exit the solar system fast. Our technology test mission idea is we would only pay attention to it for a year. We don't intend to do an interstellar mission on the, or a, into the interstellar medium on a, on a test flight. But if we can prove the whole concept of flying close to the sun and outward, we will have proved the basic concept of the mission design. The next step up from, from doing a technology test mission is to improve upon these parameters, put a science payload on, on it, and maybe even rendezvous with an interstellar object. This design is capable of rendezvousing with, we could, by going in close to the sun, as you see there in the, in the, uh, 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 in the diagram, you could actually park in a solar circular orbit and wait for that interstellar object to be discovered. And then when it's discovered, just um, optimize your sail trajectory to rendezvous with it. You could rendezvous with it before it got out to Jupiter or Saturn's orbit. And you could even, uh, if, if you have the right parameters and depending on the speeds involved and everything, uh, for the Borisov mission, we actually showed that we could rendezvous with it and land on it. And uh, so it, it, it offers a lot of promise. Now that would be a future technology step. The, Initial goal is to do the technology test mission, then to do some solar system mission like the interstellar object rendezvous, and then move out to do the uh, solar gravity lens focus. At that point, we will have proved, uh, not only will we be imaging exoplanets, but this is sort of a precursor to the ideas of interstellar thinking, they'll all be developed at the same time. We'll be able to pick the habitable planet candidates. We'll be able to know a lot more about them because we'll be imaging them. And we will have proven the basic concept of get smaller and smaller interplanetary satellites and uh, sails as the propulsion mechanism. So thank you, that's it. Thank you. We have one question. Only um, one? The only one that I find that didn't get answered by your presentation before I could ask it. <laughs> um, if we had a constellation of telescopes orbiting at 2 AU functioning as an interferometer, what would be the resolving capacity in the visible spectrum or infrared? And is it even possible to do this? Well, I'm not the person to answer that question. I know that it is being studied as a thing. I don't, you still wouldn't be able to get the image of the surface features, but you, of course you would be getting a lot of information and certainly the spectroscopic information, uh, the thing. But I, I so I, I can't give you the detailed answer on, on, the, uh, on, a, on that constellation of telescopes. The uh, basic size of a, of, um, the lambda over d limitation that basic size has is gives you a, a scale of a telescope it has to be many kilometers in diameter if you try to achieve that with a, a constellation of telescopes you can do that kind of uh, thing but you you're not going to you'd have to make them work all together as a phased array and of course that hasn't even been done here on earth to that extent thank you Louis, thanks very much we appreciate it thank you Thank you.